What's going on everyone? Today I want to show you how to image a Raspberry Pi from start to finish using the Raspberry Pi Imager Utility. This is really a bare bone basics guide for people who have never had to do this before or are coming back after having not touched one in a while. This video will pave the way for my next up and coming Raspberry Pi project videos. Essentially this is to create a good base to then dabble with my other project videos. Every website I show, I will have the links in the description below to make it easy to check out. You can also feel free to skip ahead through sections that you might already be in good shape on. Alright, let's get started. Let's begin with the hardware you will need to get started if you don't already know what you need. This is just going over base requirements with no special hat add-on modules or anything of that sort. This will just get the general functionality of a Raspberry Pi working. So to start, you'll need a Raspberry Pi model of your choosing. For demonstration purposes, in this video I'll be using a Raspberry Pi 4 Model B with 8GB of RAM. The 8GB of RAM variant is overkill for 95% of Raspberry Pi projects, so just keep that in mind. The 2 and 4GB of RAM variant really is the sweet spot. The 1GB of RAM model can be a little iffy these days with some projects, as you're cutting it close on memory. One thing to note is what I will be showing will work fine for previous models of Raspberry Pis as well. So the models 1, 2, 3, and even version 5 when it, when it is no longer on pre-order as of the time of making this video. You'll need an AC power brick for your specific model of Raspberry Pi. In my case, I'm using a USB-C power supply, however previous models required a micro USB power supply. This helpful site that I'm showing here can be used to figure out what you will need if you aren't using a Raspberry Pi 4 or 5. And so if we scroll down here, basically goes over your volt and amperage needs, and then depending on the model that you have, it'll mention your volts and amperage requirements here, as well as what connector styles you would need. So this is a pretty helpful website here. Next, you'll need a micro SD card as your Raspberry Pi's hard drive. I've had good luck with the Samsung Evo cards in my dabblings, but you can certainly choose a different brand if you like. I mainly just stick with the 32 gig models just because how inexpensive they are, and it gives plenty of room for storage. With this requiring a micro SD card, you will need a micro SD card reader of some kind as well. Some people might have one built into your computer that you can use, or you can snag a USB based micro SD card reader, which is what I'll be using in this video. And it doesn't have to be anything extreme, you can go with the barebone basic model here, which literally is just doing USB-A to micro SD, or you can go with a multi-variant, which does USB-A to different size SD cards. There's also the extra fancy variants that you can see kind of here, where this can do all sorts of different styles, along with just being a USB hub as well, and it even allows for USB-A or USB-C connectivity. As more and more new machines are coming out, especially on the Apple front, USB-C is of course your only offering, so just keep that in mind. Next, you will want a case for your Raspberry Pi to protect it. It doesn't have to be anything crazy, but the sky's the limit for options. As you can see here, you've got your super fancy gaming computer wannabe styles, and then you've got your retro gaming Nintendo looking sorts of cases. Another thing to show off here is that you can also get bundled cases that come with your power supply, fan, and even heat sinks for the chips, which even though you see all these heat sinks here, there have been a few articles that basically state that the only one that really does anything is going to be the heat sink on the CPU. So just keep that in mind. Now before I begin in the next part, I want to mention I'll be showing how to do this with three different operating system environments. I'll be showing Windows first, Linux second, and Mac OS last. This is to show any of those users exactly how to make the magic happen. However, with that being said, feel free to skip ahead to your OS type to see exactly how it should be done. For the most part, it's just going to be a rinse and repeat of the processes, but I want to show it nonetheless. With that said, let's get started showing how to slap the Raspberry Pi OS on a micro SD card using a Windows-based computer. On Raspberry Pi's website, they have the operating system images page, and on it is mentioned the Raspberry Pi imager utility. Let's start with this first, although, just to show for the sake of this video, if you do scroll down, you can see the different offerings of Raspberry Pi OS. 
The general use cases are the 32-bit versions. However, a 64-bit variant does exist so that you would be able to take advantage of a Raspberry Pi that has more than two gigs of RAM. As 32-bit operating systems can technically only max out at using 3.4 gigabytes of RAM. And the other thing which is also helpful on their website is it states the compatibility of the different versions. Now really, this day and age, if your Raspberry Pi can use a 64-bit OS, then that's the version I would recommend using. Another thing to note is that if we take a look at the 32-bit versions here, you've got three different offerings here. One is going to be Raspberry Pi OS with the desktop, aka it's actually going to have a desktop GUI environment, just like you would see with Windows or Mac OS and a Linux environment that actually has, of course, the desktop functionalities enabled on it. And you also note the size, 872 megs for this. So this is your very basic Raspberry Pi OS offering for the desktop. There, of course, is the next one, which is the same exact thing, except it comes with the recommended software, which, as you see, the size is quite different. So instead of 872 megs, 2.7 gigabytes, aka 2,701 megabytes here. To many people, this may be considered a bloated variant of it, and it may include software that you don't want. And so with that said, this is generally the version that you would go with because you can always install the dependencies or applications that you need to make a certain project work here, whereas this is going to potentially have a little bit of garbage on it that you may not want. And then finally is going to be the Raspberry Pi OS Lite version. The Lite version means that it does not have a desktop GUI on it. Now, of course, if you were to install this after the fact, you could install the desktop GUI. And so effectively in this variant, you are going to be strictly dabbling with a command line terminal interface. And let's just scroll back down to the 64-bit variant. And as you see here, the 64-bit variant only has, at least at the time of this video, only has a with desktop and the light version here. And then one last thing just to go over is that they do have the Raspberry Pi OS legacy here. And so this is compatible with every single Raspberry Pi model. And the thing to note is the version that it is based on is going to be Debian version 10 Buster. And if we scroll up here, this is going to be on the newer version of Debian 11 Bullseye, which is not actually the latest and greatest version of Debian. Raspberry Pi OS usually is a, is a few months behind with the absolute latest and greatest. So at least at the time of this video, Debian version 12 Bookworm is the latest and greatest. And one last thing actually before we do move on is that there actually is a version of Raspberry Pi desktop which is compatible with a PC or a Mac. So if you actually wanted to utilize their customized version of Debian, you could actually install it on a PC or a Mac. I personally have never had a use case for this, but maybe if you are trying to do development or something of that sort in the Raspberry Pi OS, then you may go this route. But generally speaking, you would just use the base Linux Debian for this sort of use case. So back up at the top, let's go ahead and click on the Raspberry Pi Imager. So of course, with this being the Windows variant, let's go ahead and download for Windows, and then we will open file. One thing to also mention is that you're going to need admin rights on the machine, otherwise you will not be able to move forward here. So I'm going to hit yes for this, and we will click install, and then I'm going to leave this checked as run the Raspberry Pi Imager, and I'm going to go ahead and close out of everything. Whenever I am doing any sort of OS imaging to a thumb drive or an SD card or anything of that sort, I like to make sure that everything is closed out and it may even be a good idea to reboot your computer before you actually move forward with this. Now, in case you do reboot your computer and you are not having this checked and hit finish, I'm just gonna uncheck this real quick, I'll hit finish. This did actually install the utility on the computer. So if we go to the start menu, I actually have it here. If this doesn't show up, of course, you can go ahead and just click in here and you can just do a search for Raspberry. If I can type it correctly, Raspberry, and then it should come up with the Pi Imager and we can just launch it. And of course it's gonna pop up because we need admin rights. So I will hit yes. 
So at this point, before you get going, make sure that you have your SD card plugged into your computer, whether it is an SD card reader in the computer already or a USB based one. So first we will select the first offering here for operating system to choose an operating system. Let's click on this. And so this actually gives you some more customizations for operating system options than what the website was actually showing. So you can actually go in and select something other than the, what I'd consider default offering here, which is the Raspberry Pi OS 32 bit version, which also has the Raspberry Pi desktop, which is the recommended. However, you can feel free to poke around in here and just take a look at the other options. So just as we saw on their website, here are more of the offerings available to us. And so this is where we'll find the legacy ver variants, 64 bit versions, and also all the different styles. So light, full, AK super bloated edition, and 64 bit OS and 64 bit light. So of course this is the desktop variant, light variant. And we can go back. There's also general purpose OS. So you could install just Ubuntu. In this case, it gave an error, but it would usually give you more options and it kind of self-explanatory choose from Ubuntu desktop, server and core images. There's also all these other ones here that you can also choose from. Certainly feel free to click into these and maybe not get an error to explore. There's also media player OSs. So there's a whole bunch of offerings in here. Feel free to take a gander at those. But for the purpose of this video, I'm just sticking with the basics here. There's also all sorts of other stuff. Premium and paid for operating systems. Lots of things in here. Other specific purpose OSs. All sorts of stuff here. You can also do the erase to format the card. And you can also select a custom image here. So you could actually just download some sort of very customized image and slap it on here, which I have heard of people having to troubleshoot an entirely different operating system imaging method using the Raspberry Pi imager to get on not even a Raspberry Pi. Anyhow, let's scroll back to the top. For the sake of this video to keep things super simple, I am going to select just the Raspberry Pi OS 32 bit version with the desktop. However, you can certainly feel free to choose the 64 bit version or the light version or whatever. Everything's going to be the same exact steps here. So like I said, for the purpose of this, let's just click on here and then choose storage. We'll click here and hopefully it will automatically detect the SD card that you have plugged in. In my case, it is detecting the 32 gigabyte SD card. So we'll click on that. It's now selected. Before you hit right, here's one option that a lot of people don't realize is here. And this is by clicking on this gear here. And this is actually pretty cool because you can customize things in it to save time. And it kind of makes it a little easier to use it via the GUI here. And so you can set a host name. And for the sake of this video, you can feel free to delete out whatever is here and change it. But I'll just type in Raspberry Pi 4. You can enable SSH. So if you are especially using the light edition, then you could go in and use a terminal such as putty or something of that sort to get into your Raspberry Pi without having to physically be at it as long as it's on the network and turned on. And then with enabling SSH, you would also have to choose between using password authentication or the much more secure method of allowing a public key authentication only. And then you would put that in here. For the sake of this video, I am just going to actually enable it and just use password authentication. You can also set your username and password. And so in my case, I'll just go ahead and set my username to digital scriptorium. You can obviously feel free to change it to whatever you like. And then of course you would want to set a password. What I've said is not very secure, but I do highly recommend you set something very secure here. If your Raspberry Pi has wireless capabilities, you can actually pre-set it up here. With this being the Raspberry Pi 4 Model B, it definitely has wireless. And so I could check this and I could type in a wireless network. You know, I could just type in wireless, aka whatever your wireless network actually is, you would type it in here and then you would type in the password for it as well. If you actually have hidden wireless, then you could also check this. But for the sake of this video, I am actually not going to use wireless. And scrolling down as well, if you 
enable wireless, you actually have to set a wireless LAN country. And the thing that you can do is you can manually change this out, or you can use the drop down here, and then you can scroll for a long time, or as I found, type in the first letter, and then it will start trying to automatically complete it. And then in my case, I'm in the US, so I will just put an S on there. And then just to be safe, I do like to open this and hit enter. And then what I like to do, and the key thing is make sure you hit enter here, otherwise it will stay as GB when you click this little arrow here, and it should hopefully show the actual country that you selected. Otherwise, I found that sometimes it doesn't actually hold on to this, and it just defaults it to the GB country. The other option is you can set your locale settings, which I do recommend doing. In my case, time zone looks fine, keyboard layout looks good, but obviously feel free to change these up depending on where you are in the world and what your keyboard is. The other thing I like to do is I do like to disable telemetry, as it's just to me, a bunch of nonsense data that doesn't have to be transported back to them for data collection purposes. You can also have it so that it immediately ejects the media when finished, and you can also make it so it plays a sound when it's finished. In my case, I am going to leave this checked, but I disabled the telemetry portion. So now we can hit save, and then we can hit write. In this case, a pop-up comes up just basically stating that it's going to destroy any data that is on the SD card. So this is one last opportunity to either say no or yes here. In my case, I don't care what's on here, so we can click yes. And then it's just the waiting game. And if anything pops up, I like to just be completely hands off from it here, as I feel sometimes if something pops up, saying a format a drive or something like that, that it could potentially just kind of break the whole process. So just go hands off at this point, just be patient, walk away, get a drink, take a nap, use the bathroom, whichever you prefer. When it's at the verifying step, it's basically checking all the data integrity just to make sure that nothing is corrupted in this. A lot of times this is kind of the step that will show that your SD card is actually bad. Worst case, with how inexpensive SD cards are, you can always just buy a new one and keep at it. All right, so that is now done. So at this point we have this pop-up saying you can now remove the SD card from the reader. So we can click continue and we can close out of this and then don't worry about any sort of pop-ups like this. You can just hit cancel. And then at this point, you can move on to the next step, which would be plugging the SD card into your Raspberry Pi and turning it on. All right, next up, let's get started showing how to slap the Raspberry Pi OS on a micro SD card using a, a Linux-based computer. In this case, I am using Linux Debian with the Cinnamon desktop environment. So let's go ahead and go down to start, and let's fire up Firefox here. And so on Raspberry Pi's OS page, if you did not watch the very beginning of, of the Windows-based environment method of getting the OS on an SD card, then in this section, you would go ahead and choose what you want to download. So in this case, we're actually going to select download for Ubuntu for x86, which should work perfectly fine for Debian. So let's click on this here. And the website does display a little bit differently than on the Windows variant. For instance, if you actually click on see all download options, then it gives the page that is mentioned in the Windows based variant. And just to quickly go over things, as I'd mentioned in the previous portion, is that you're gonna have multiple options to choose from. You'll have the 32-bit versions up here, which is the default that usually gets set when an image is installed on a Raspberry Pi. However, if you have a newer Raspberry Pi that is one of these models, then I do actually recommend using the 64-bit variants here. Now, to break down just what the differences are between the variants themselves, so for one, the 32-bit version can only use a maximum of 3.4 gigabytes of RAM. So if you have a Raspberry Pi that has 4 gigabytes or 8 gigabytes of RAM, you're not going to be fully taking advantage of all that system RAM. So just something to keep in the back of your mind. As far as these three different options here, so you have Raspberry Pi OS with desktop, which means that it has a desktop GUI, just like as you see here, it does not have a terminal-based command prompt of sorts that you would have to utilize. So there's the Raspberry Pi OS with desktop. Note the size, 872 megs. So this gives you basically the bare bones of what you need to get this variant going here. You can, of course, install software that you need, 
and to customize it and whatnot here. There's the other variant, which is Raspberry Pi OS with desktop and recommended software. Note the size here is 2.7 gigabytes or 2,701 megabytes. A little bit of a big difference here. This is also installing a lot of stuff that a lot, a lot of people may not want. So there could be a lot of bloat in here. So I usually recommend sticking with this if you are going with the desktop environment. There is the Raspberry Pi OS Lite version, which does not have a desktop GUI, and it is strictly a terminal-based operating system with a command prompt of sorts. And then for the 64-bit variant, then you only have the with desktop, without the bloat, as I'll call it, and then the light version, which is the terminal. So anyhow, I just wanted to mention that portion. So since we already downloaded it, let's go up to the download section here, and let's go ahead and go into the downloads folder. I'm going to go ahead and double click on it, and then I'm going to click on install package, and then you will have to type in your root credentials here. And if you want to see what's happening, you can just pop open the terminal there. And then we can click out of this, click out of that, and you can get out of your browser. And the thing I always recommend is before firing up any sort of utility that is putting either an operating system installer on a thumb drive or SD card, or is putting an operating system on an SD card or thumb drive, always recommend closing out of everything, making sure that the computer is basically at idle or as best it can be at idle. And sometimes it may even just be best to reboot your computer before you start with the next step. I'll leave it up to you what you want to do. So let's begin here. So I'm going to go down to the menu here and I'm just going to do a search for Raspberry. And then here is our option here, the imager. So let's go ahead and click on it. And so it's going to open for us here. Just as I had mentioned in the different variations of operating systems that I'm showing how this is done, everything for the most part is pretty much rinse and repeat. So the first thing we'll do is let's click on choose OS. And you do have a few different options in here for things. By default, this is still the generic one that a lot of people will choose. And for the sake of this video, we will choose this one, which is going to be the 32-bit version, which has Raspberry Pi desktop on it, recommended as I'd mentioned. You could go in and actually choose Raspberry Pi OS Other. And you can select the light version the full version, which is the super bloated edition. And then also, if you scroll down here, you also have the 64-bit variants, as well as the legacy ones, as I had mentioned, as well as the legacy versions, which is utilizing Buster and not Debian Bullseye. And no matter which one you select here, it's all going to be the same experience of putting the image on the SD card. And then you also have other general purpose operating systems you can choose from. There's Ubuntu and a bunch of other ones. And then if you were to click on these, it would break it down for more options. You can feel free to explore these, but since for the purpose of this video, we are just strictly utilizing Raspberry Pi OS, we're just going to go with that. But anyhow, one other thing to also mention is it does have erase or format the card as FAT32 here. And then you can also select a custom image if none of them are showing up in here. And as I'd mentioned in the Windows based variant, you can actually technically use the custom image to troubleshoot things not even on Raspberry Pis. So it's kind of interesting. So anyhow, we will select the 32-bit one just for the sake of this video. Storage, let's do choose storage. And then if all goes well, it should see that your SD card does exist on the computer, whether it's plugged in directly into an SD card reader that's built into your computer, or if you have a USB-based one, it's hopefully going to see it. So we'll click on this. One thing to note before we actually click on right is there is this gear icon here. This is actually really cool in that it allows you to set up a whole bunch of configurations before the computer is even going to start. So I highly recommend utilizing this here. So you can go ahead and select the host name, which is going to be the computer's name. And for the sake of this video, I'm just gonna call it Raspberry Pi 4. But of course you could delete this out and put in whatever you want here. You can also enable SSH, which means you can use a terminal such as PuTTY or something of that sort to get into your machine. And by default, it says use password authentication, which is not exactly the most secure method, but for the sake of this video, we, we will leave this as is. There is the more secure method of allow public key authentication only, in which case you would put in your information for that here. But like I said, for the sake of this video, we will just use password authentication. There will be the option of set a username and password. And so for here, I'll just go ahead and change this out here and we'll just go ahead and type in digital 
scriptorium and then you can go ahead and set the password i'm setting a very not secure password here so i strongly recommend you put in something that is actually secure and then you can also pre-configure the wireless which is pretty cool and so you could type in your wireless name here and so you can just type in wireless if you have a hidden wireless band then you could check hidden ssid and then you would also just type in the password of it here for this video i'm not going to utilize this here but just to show one other piece here in order for the wireless to work you actually have to set a wireless lan country by default it's set to gb aka global you can click this arrow here which is going to make it so that you can hunt down things and if you start scrolling there is actually a tiny little scroll option here to grab it it's pretty finicky. What I recommend doing is delete this out by clicking in here and just hitting delete and then type in the first letter of your country and then it automatically tries to auto complete it for you. I'm going to just finish it off by putting US in and the key thing is hit enter and then click the drop down and it should hopefully go to the one that you actually put in. If you don't hit enter there it will stick to the global GB one. So just some Fair warning there. But like I'd mentioned, I'm not actually going to set the wireless up on this machine, but just something to throw out there. The other thing is you can also set your locale. In my case, I'm going to leave it as is. That looks fine for me. You also have a few options down here. You can do play sound when finished. You can eject media when finished. It also by default is enabling telemetry, which is sending data back. What I recommend, at least for me personally, is I usually just uncheck the enable telemetry as it's really just data that I just don't care about them having. So we'll just go ahead and click save here if everything looks good. And now we can go ahead and click on write. It's going to pop up basically warning us that whatever is on the SD card is going to be nuked and erased. So this is your final warning that if you feel there is anything that you need on there to be backed up, back it up before you continue on. So anyhow, everything is fine for me. So I will hit yes. And then it's going to ask you for your credentials again for root. So go ahead and type those in. If all goes well, it should start downloading it. And then it's going to write it to the SD card. So at this point, just be patient. Feel free to walk away, get a drink, use the bathroom, take a nap, whatever you want to do. When it's at the verifying step, it's basically just double checking the data integrity, making sure everything's happy and it's not corrupted. Sometimes if this fails, it can actually mean the SD card itself is bad. So just keep that in the back of your mind that if it continues to fail after multiple attempts, you may want to just get a different SD card. All right, and now we have this pop up here, which says you can now remove the SD card from the reader. So in this case, we can just click OK, and then we can close out of the imager tool. And then at this point, you can go ahead and remove the SD card, slap it into your Raspberry Pi and go ahead and turn it on. All right, let's get started with showing how to slap the Raspberry Pi OS on a micro SD card using a Mac OS based computer. So we're on the Raspberry Pi OS page here. And if we scroll down, there's the Raspberry Pi Imager utility. And so you can go ahead and click on download from Mac OS here. However, before we do, let's scroll down here. And there is the option to see all download options, just so I can explain a few things in case you did not watch the Windows variant or Linux variant before this, where I went over this previously. So there is the Raspberry Pi 32-bit image here, and then there is the 64-bit image down here. Now the 32-bit image, as it mentioned up top here, is compatible with all Raspberry Pi models. The version that is down here is only compatible with select models, and that's because these models are capable of having 64-bit instructions, which means it can use four gigabytes of RAM or more, and it just allows it so that it can actually use 64-bit instructions, whereas a CPU that only has 32-bit capabilities cannot utilize a 64-bit one. In fact, if you actually try to put a 64-bit flashed SD card into your older Raspberry Pi, it will complain about a kernel error. So just keep that in mind. Generally speaking, I do recommend if you have one of these models or a Model 5, which is not listed here because it hasn't been completely released yet, that you use the 64-bit one, as it just seems to be a little bit faster. And I have not run into any compatibility issues, but I'm sure there's something out there potentially that you may run into, so just keep that in the back of your mind. So let's just go over the different options here besides 32-bit and 64-bit. 
So there's the Raspberry Pi OS with desktop, and so that means that it actually has a desktop GUI experience like you would see in Mac OS here, or Windows, or a Linux-based operating system that actually has the desktop experience turned on. Next down is the Raspberry Pi OS with desktop and recommended software. Now, the very first one, 872 megabytes of storage is required, whereas the one with the recommended software is 2.7 gigabytes or 2,701 megabytes. So there's a lot more stuff going on here, and it may have a lot of software that you may not need, and so many consider this to be a bloated version, and so most people will choose this one if they want the desktop experience. Worst case, you can always install whatever you need on this one and still potentially not have the bloat that this one has, but they have this as an option. And then down at the bottom is the Raspberry Pi OS Lite. So this is the variant that does not have the desktop GUI experience to it. So you're going to have a terminal command line interface instead. Just throwing that out there, depending on the project or your use case, you would select between these. And so as it just kind of shows with the 64-bit ones, you only actually have two options, and it's the desktop experience non-bloated edition and then the light version here. And if you do scroll down, there's also the legacy versions. This is just a version behind the current Raspberry Pi OS. So it's on Debian 10 instead of Debian 11, as you see here. And then one thing to actually just show off is there actually is Raspberry Pi desktop for PC and Mac, so you don't actually have to necessarily install it on a Raspberry Pi. However, I have never really seen a use case where anyone would actually use this, but maybe for development purposes or something of that sort. Anyhow, let's go back to the top here. So let's go ahead and download the Raspberry Pi imager, and then we can click on download from Mac OS, and we can allow if you get that pop up. And then let's go ahead and pop this open here. And then at this point, I actually like to go ahead and close out of anything I have open. This is more or less just to make sure that the computer is at rest and that there is nothing else running in the background. So whenever I'm slapping an operating system or operating system installer on an SD card or a USB thumb drive, I just like the computer to be at rest so that there's no conflicting software running that could cause corruption or something of that sort. Anyhow, you can go ahead and select Raspberry Pi Imager here, double click on it. And this is basically just warning, are we sure we want to open it? I'm just going to click open. All right, so the utility has popped up here. So we can go ahead and click on Choose Operating System. And so again, if you did not see any of the previous two pieces, the Windows or the Linux-based variant of this, I'll just quickly go through and explain some of this a little bit. So by default, there is the Raspberry Pi OS 32-bit version, which has the desktop experience to it. And this is the non-bloated version, which is only basically 0.9 gigabytes. There's also the other options, which as I'd shown on the website, if you click here, you have your light version, your super bloated edition, 32-bit here, and then if you scroll down, you also have the 64-bit desktop variant and the 64-bit light version, and then the legacy versions, as I'd, as I'd mentioned. If you click back, there's also other general purpose operating systems, so there's Ubuntu and a few others here that you can choose from. I'll leave it up to you to, you know, feel free to scope these out here. But like I said, the purpose of this video is strictly Raspberry Pi OS, but also there's media player OSs to choose from, emulation and game operating systems, other specific purpose operating systems, freemium and paid for OSs, utilities here. You can erase and format uh, as FAT32. You can also use this as a imager for custom images. And in some cases, the reasoning behind this is I've seen people actually use the Raspberry Pi imager to troubleshoot entirely different operating systems on entirely different hardware. It's not Raspberry Pi. Anyhow, for the sake of this video, I'm just going to choose the 32-bit one here. If you did select any of the others or a 64-bit variant, the process for putting it on an SD card is exactly the same. Nothing to worry about if you were to go down a different path here. So we'll just select this one for the sake of this video. Click on Choose Storage. If all is well, if the SD card is plugged into your computer via the potential SD card port on the machine, or if you have a USB micro SD card reader plugged in, then you should hopefully see this here. So we'll select that, the one that popped up. And before we actually hit right, this little gear here is actually a very impressive piece to this utility. 
it actually gives you the opportunity to adjust all sorts of configurations in the image itself so that you don't have to change it on the Raspberry Pi. So it kind of speeds things up and makes it pretty snazzy. So you can change the host name, aka the computer's name. And so you could blank this out, change it to whatever you want. For the sake of this video, I'm just going to add a 4 here, Raspberry Pi 4. Gives you the option to enable SSH. And if you do have it enabled, then you're either going to have the use password authentication or the allow public key authentication only, which is more secure. So this allows you to use something like PuTTY or some other SSH client to be able to remotely connect via terminal to your machine and take control of it from there. You also have the opportunity to set the username and password. And for the username, I will go ahead and change it to Digital Scriptorium. And then I'll set a password, which is not super secure, but I highly recommend you put a super secure password on it. And then if your Raspberry Pi supports wireless connectivity, then you can enable configure wireless LAN. You can put in your wireless network's name. Just for the sake of this video, I'm just going to type in wireless. If it's a hidden wireless, band then you could check that and then you can also go ahead and type in your password which by default it has show password set so if you uncheck that it's just going to change it to that and then the other thing is if you have wireless set you also need to toggle it to your country and so the best thing to really do here is click in here delete it out type in the first initial of your country it's going to try to auto complete it for you i'm just going to type in s for us I'm also going to, this is key, hit enter. And then if you click the drop down here, it should ideally show the country that you put in here. Basically, if you don't hit enter and you click this, it's going to just default it back to the GB global LAN country. So that's why it's key to hit enter here. The other thing is that you can also set your locale. So you can change this up. For the sake of this video, I am actually going to not use wireless. And so if we scroll down here, there's going to be the option to play a sound when finished, eject media when finished, and also enable telemetry by default. So these are all, of course, up to you, but I'm going to uncheck enable telemetry as I feel that's just data that's going to get sent to them, which I would rather they just not have. And like I said, play sound is optional. I'm not going to worry about it because it's going to give us a visual prompt anyhow that it's done. So I'm going to hit save here, and then we can go ahead and click on write. It's going to give you one warning here that basically states that anything that is on the SD card is going to be deleted and nuked. So this is your opportunity to back up anything one last time if you feel you need to. In my case, I feel fine with this, so we can just click yes. And then you'll just have to type in the credentials of your account. And then you may get the pop-up where your Raspberry Pi imager would like to access files. Just click OK, and then we'll just let it work its magic here. So just be patient. Feel free to walk away, use the bathroom, get a drink, take a nap, whichever you want to do. When it hits the verifying stage, it's just verifying the data integrity. So it's just double checking that there isn't any corruption. If you do hit errors at this point, it could mean that your SD card is bad. So just keep that in the back of your mind that if you keep hitting errors at this point, just get a different SD card with how inexpensive they are. All right, now you should see this pop up here. It says you can now remove the SD card from the reader. So we can click continue here and then we can close out of this and we can get out of the Raspberry Pi imager. So at this point, you can go ahead and disconnect the SD card from your machine. Go ahead and put it into your Raspberry Pi and start it up. And so you should see kind of that rainbow screen pop up for a little bit there. That's basically just the system power on test. And then eventually you should start seeing a whole bunch of things popping up on the screen here. Just let it do its magic. And just be patient here. Generally the very first time that it actually boots up, it can take a little bit longer than the usual boot time. All right, so if all is well, then it should have booted into the desktop at this point. So the desktop experience is based on modified version of the LXDE desktop environment. And so we'll go through a general overview of kind of the basics here, just so you can kind of understand what's happening in case you're not used to this OS at all. So we'll start with the top right. So you've got your system clock here, your volume options, which you can mute it or you can change your volume bar here. You've got your network portion here. In this case, I can actually turn wireless on because I didn't have it enabled in the configuration. There is Bluetooth, 
which just gives you your general Bluetooth options here. If the machine has updates, you can click this here and click on show updates, in which case let's go ahead and actually click on install. That way this is all up to date. One thing to mention is that even though many people believe that Linux doesn't need updates, there are critical vulnerabilities that pop up all the time. So I strongly recommend keeping it up to date unless there is an absolute need to keep it at a certain version. And just be patient depending on your network. It could take a little bit. And then once it gets done downloading them, it should start installing the packages. So for a brief second there, you would have seen it said system is up to date and the little pop-up that was up there is now gone. So with that being said, let's actually go ahead and reboot this here because whenever updates are happening, I like to make sure it's fresh. So I went up to the Raspberry Pi icon in the top left here and we'll go to shutdown. And then it's a little scary because even though it says shutdown, now it actually gives shutdown options. And then you can either shut down, reboot, or log out. So let's reboot. All right, we should now be back at the desktop again. So let's go over the next bunch of things here. So of course you've got your waste basket here, which is essentially your trash or your recycle bin. Click out of that. And as I'd shown you right before we rebooted, if you go up to the Raspberry Pi icon, then this is essentially your start menu or other means of accessing applications and all that good stuff. So there's a programming portion here, which just has uh, generic programming apps or utilities, whichever you want to call them. You've got internet, you've got Chromium web browser, you've got sound and video. So it's got the VLC media player, which is a very powerful media player if you've never used it. Graphics, so this would just be a basic image viewer. Accessories, so you got an archiver, calculator, file manager, there's the Raspberry Pi Imager, which is built right in. PDF Viewer, Raspberry Pi Diagnostics, SD Card Copier, Task Manager, Terminal, and Text Editor. And then you also have a Help section here. So there's a Bookshelf, Debian References, Get Started, Help, and Projects. So stuff you can feel free to take a gander at there. Preferences, Add and Remove Software, Appearance Settings, Main Menu Editor, Mouse and Keyboard Settings, Print Settings, Raspberry Pi Configuration, recommended software, screen configuration. And then you also have the run section here, which allows you to run a command to execute. The other thing to note is that if you right click on your desktop, you get a whole bunch of options. So you have new folder, new file. You can paste something if you copied it or you cut it. Select all, invert selection, sort files. This gives you more of a breakdown here. You can ascend, you can set it to ascending, descending by name, by modification time, by size, by file type. It's also desktop preferences. Let's click on desktop preferences. And so this gives you some appearance settings here so you can change up how the desktop image or desktop background is being displayed. So you have a few options here. You can feel free to take a gander at. There's the picture, which you can click on here. And it does have a bunch of built-in options here. So you can select like trees. You've got color options here. There's text color options. We'll just leave those as is. Down at the bottom here is the option for desktop icons. So you could click on documents, then it will appear here. We can also uncheck it to get rid of it. External disks would be if we actually have a thumb drive or SD card or something like that plugged in through an SD card reader. Stuff like that would appear here. There's the taskbar options here. So you can adjust the color of the taskbar. You can put it top bottom, whichever you prefer. So yeah, there's color, there's text color, system, all sorts of different options here. Defaults, you can change all sorts of stuff. So we can just hit okay here. And then next up in the taskbar at the top, you have your world internet icon here. So if you click this, it's going to open up your web browser, which is Chromium. Double click it, you can maximize it here. And then you can just go to Google, just as you would in any browser. And there you go. And we can close out of this. And then the two folders, if you click on this, so this is basically your file browser here. So there's a lot to look through here, but of course you have your, basically your, your profile here. So this is Digital Scriptorium's profile. So you've got your desktop, which should be blank. You know, feel free to skim through things here. It also states how much free space you have here. So something to keep an eye on if you're loading a whole bunch of stuff on. We can click out of this. Next, you have your terminal. And so if you ended up loading up the Raspberry Pi OS Lite Edition, then you would strictly be seeing a terminal, which would look close to this. 
except of course it would be maximized and you would have nothing up here. It would just be a black page with this being referenced. Now with the terminal open, I do want to show a feature that is built into Raspberry Pi OS and it's meant strictly for Raspberry Pis. And so if you type in sudo space raspi config, and so sudo is effectively making it so that we are granting it basically admin privileges to run this command. So let's hit enter. And then now it's going to pop up with this. So the Raspberry Pi software configuration tool, aka raspi config, has all sorts of interesting features in here. And if you're using the light version, then you would want to go into this right off the bat just to make sure everything looks good. And there may be some configurations that you want to change. I'm just going to do a general rundown of this here just to show off some of the stuff that is in here. A lot of this stuff can be done just through the GUI, but for some people, this is actually an easier method to do it as it's kind of a one-stop shop for setting a whole bunch of things up. So let's start off with number one, system options, configure system settings. Let's hit enter. And so again, you have your wireless options here. And so just as I'd shown you, you have to select a country in here in order for it to actually be activated. Now in this case, I'm not going to activate it. So let's hit tab and tab again to get over to cancel and hit enter. And that's going to say it's not valid. And that's fine. And then it gives you an option to enter your, your wireless SSID. I'm not going to enter one, so I'm just going to hit cancel. So let's go back into that. And the second option is going to be audio. And so you can change up your audio output here if you wanted to. Just showing this here. So we're just going to tab down again until we get over cancel. And let's get into system options one more time. And then it's going to give you the option to change your password of Digital Scriptorium, which I'm not going to do. Host name, so that's going to give you the option to change the host name. This here will give you the option of enabling booting into desktop or into command line. You can make it so that it waits for a network connection before it boots. You can change the splash screen so that it's not showing the uh, Raspberry Pi version, but it would actually show a more traditional Linux booting screen, which shows all of the services and file system all loading up. If you want to change that, you can change the behavior of the power LED. In this case, we are just going to go back and then you've got display options. So there's all sorts of stuff here. You can remove black borders around screens, enable, disable screen blanking, set resolution for headless use, set options for composite output. There's a bunch of random things in here that have very particular use cases interface options. Let's take a look at that. So there's a legacy camera, enable, disable legacy camera support, SSH. If you did not enable SSH in the Raspberry Pi imager utility, then you can enable it here. VNC. So if you want to use the graphical remote access using real VNC, automatic loading of SPI kernel module, automatic loading of I2C kernel module, enable, disable shell messages on the serial connection, Enable disable one wire interface. Enable disable remote access to GPIO pins. And then we'll hit back. And then there's performance options. So there's the option to overclock the CPU. Now, when it comes down to overclocking, your mileage is going to be very varied. So be very careful if you are actually going to try and adjust the CPU clock. You've got GPU memory allocation, so you can change the amount of memory made available to the GPU, aka the graphics processing unit. Enable, disable, read-only file system. Fan, you can set the behavior of the GPIO pin fan configuration. Back, lo localization options. Capture, configure language and regional settings. So you've got your locale, if you didn't set that before. Your time zone, if you didn't set it before. Your keyboard layout, if you didn't set it before. Your wireless LAN country set legal wireless channels for your country if you didn't set it before. And then advanced options. So you can expand the file system to ensure that all the SD card is, is available, which I actually do recommend doing this just to be safe, which we will do that in just a moment here. Enable, disable, X comp manager, composition manager, enable, disable, predictable network, if names, configure network proxy settings, choose network or USB device boot, select latest or default boot ROM software, Enable experimental Wayland backend, set network configuration tool. 
So we're just going to hit back just to continue showing here before we expand out the footprint of the partition all the way to the max of the SD card. One thing you can also do here is you can click on update. It will just call out and see if there's a newer version of the tool in case there is not. And then you can also go to option nine, which just mentions the version. So let's go back to number six for the advanced option. And then for the A1 option, ensure that all of the SD card is available. I like to double check this and I just hit enter. Root partition has been resized. The file system will be enlarged upon the next reboot. We can hit okay. And now at this point, we can just tab down and hit finish. And then would you like to reboot now? Since we went ahead and made that change, let's do yes. All right, we are back at the desktop again after it rebooted, after we expanded the partition all the way out to utilize the full space of the SD card, just in case it didn't already do that. Now I do wanna go back into the terminal real quick and we will maximize this. So if you are unfamiliar with a Linux environment and this is your very first time dabbling in it, I just wanna show off just a few quick things just to get your feet wet in the whole terminal command environment. So if you wanna keep your machine up to date without relying on the operating system, sniffing out the updates and pulling them down, one thing you may do is you type in sudo space apt, and there's a few ways of actually doing this here get update and hit enter. So what this is going to do is it will call out and it will pull down a list of information of all the latest software packages. And so basically it caches it. So now if we do a sudo space apt get upgrade and hit enter, it's now going to say, okay, here's the list of updated things. What packages do you have? And it's going to do basically a side-by-side -side comparison and say if anything actually needs to be updated. And then it would prompt you if something needs to be updated here. And it will give you a list of applications, kind of like this here, where it will show everything that's kind of needed. It'll also reference how much space it may take up, stuff like that. Now you may occasionally get this where it mentions that the application installed is no longer required, in which case you can do exactly as it states here do the sudo apt auto remove. So we can do that. Prompt us and tell us that there's gonna be X amount of space freed. Do you really wanna continue? Yes, hit enter. And then it brings us back to the waiting terminal here. Now the commands that I had mentioned up here to some are more of legacy commands, but they still fully function here. You can also do basically the same exact thing by doing sudo apt update and then also sudo apt upgrade. Since we removed the package that's no longer needed, it's all happy here. Now the commands that I showed you are more in line with the stable upgrade methods. There's another option which will leap the machine potentially ahead to latest and greatest stuff, but may potentially, keyword potentially, cause instability or break stuff. And so you would do this with more of a grain of salt. So the command for the more aggressive upgrade option is sudo space apt get dist dash upgrade. So since everything's really up to date on this, it's not doing anything. But if you're really wanting to make sure that you are to the latest and greatest up to date, you want it now, you would do this option. Now the last one I did once again, because I had the apt dash get in it is still considered more of a legacy command. However, it still works, but the more newer command for that would be sudo full dash upgrade. So I feel as though these commands are very key to know as you're going to have to use them for keeping your machine up to date. You can also do things like pulling applications down from terminal itself. So you could do sudo apt get update so I strongly recommend doing before you attempt to pull an application down. And you could of course do the sudo apt update, whichever you prefer, they have the same exact power. So what you could do is, as just a very basic thing, we'll do sudo apt install, and then let's just do something very basic like git. And then we can hit enter. In this case, git is already installed here. If it wasn't, then it would state 
the version and potentially dependencies that it needs to also pull down and then it would state how much space it's going to use up and do you want to do it or not so then you would hit yes or no depending on what you got to do there so anyhow i just wanted to mention that bit so that's all you need to do to get a raspberry pi going with the baseline operating system and configurations if you found this video to be useful please like it and subscribe to my channel to keep up with my project video guides I also invite you to check out my other videos on my channel if you have not done so already. Lots of interesting video guides and many more to come. Anyhow, until next time, take it easy.